from Akron Community Foundation, the 53rd Bert Polsky Humanitarian Awards. Celebrating Greater Akron's distinguished leaders. Your host is John Petouris, President and CEO of Akron Community Foundation. Welcome everyone to a very special program. In a typical year, we'd be gathering with all of you at the Hilton Hotel in Fairlawn, celebrating the individuals who have made Greater Akron what it is today, the recipients of the Bert A. Polsky Humanitarian Award. COVID-19 changed that, so we didn't present an award in 2020, and this year, given the uncertainty of gathering large numbers of people indoors, we have opted for this commemorative video program instead recalling the impact of all of the recipients of the Polsky Humanitarian Award. I'd like to take a moment right now to thank our sponsors who enabled us to create this look back on more than 50 years of community leadership. A heartfelt thank you to Medical Mutual, Ernst & Young, and KeyBank. Next year, we hope we'll be returning to our tradition of honoring new recipients in front of a live audience it's been the privilege of Akron Community Foundation to host the Polsky Award since 1990. The award itself was created in 1969 by what was then the Akron Chamber of Commerce, better known today as our Greater Akron Chamber. For the first 30 years that ACF sponsored the Polsky Award, it was produced, written, and emceed by our friend Dave Lieberth who gave up his duties in 2019 when he was selected as the latest recipient of the award. Good evening, John. It's an honor to be with you on this special program tonight. It's good to see you, David. I can hardly wait, by the way, <laughs> when I can finally retire this picture. Imagine looking at this every single day of your time as our Polsky honoree. Well, for two years, it's been hanging in your lobby. Um, and I have to say, John, the good news is you've had no vermin in the lobby good during point. that period of time. But uh, retire is what I'm aiming for. And I can hardly wait to join my fellow recipients, all of whom are hanging in the boardroom of the foundation. But before we can do that, Dave, we have one more time together honoring these past recipients by sharing the stories of these 58 individuals who have helped shape much of what Greater Akron is today. And to do that, we're joined by Akron Community Foundation's board chair and retired Akron Police Captain, Sylvia Trundle. Thank you, John. The Polsky Humanitarian Award is the highest honor Greater Akron bestows on those who have inspired us through their good works over decades and who continue to inspire us today. The award is named for the legendary department store president, Bert Polsky, who served the interest of Akron for over 50 years of the 20th century. Bert was a leader of the Chamber of Commerce. He served on the board of the University of Akron and on the boards of just about every major service organization that benefited Greater Akron, including our very own Akron Community Foundation, where he served as a founding trustee. Each recipient is remembered permanently at Akron Community Foundation offices, where the portraits of every recipient are displayed in our Bert A. Polsky boardroom, as well as on a permanent memorial at Cascade Plaza in downtown Akron. While these honorees are singled out for their efforts, they're carrying out a tradition that is embraced by the entire community. Our community has long been one that comes together during times of need. Last month, we recalled the 20-year anniversary of 9-11 when terrorists struck New York City in 2001. The response of Greater Akron was immediate. No city in the country gave a larger per capita contribution to the city of New York after 9-11 than the $1.4 million raised just two weeks after Akron Community Foundation announced the creation of the Fire Truck Fund with the Akron Beacon Journal and First Merit Bank. This past year and a half has also been a testament to the extraordinary philanthropic and humanitarian nature of this community. As our country grappled with a health pandemic on a scale that we've never seen before in our lifetimes, you, our local community members, contributed over $22 million in charitable dollars to the Community Foundation. Even more importantly, you granted nearly $21 million back out into the community, supporting the vital local nonprofits who are out there serving our neighbors every single day. 
It's an inspiration to many of us that from its very beginnings, Akron was well served by philanthropy. Akron Community Foundation began in 1955 with a $1 million bequest made by Edwin Shaw, the factory superintendent of the B.F. Goodrich Company. His legacy that began as the Akron Community Trust has grown substantially. Today, we manage assets of nearly $290 million, and over our 66-year history, we have invested back into the greater Akron community nearly $200 million in grants to charitable organizations. This is one of the reasons why we live in such a successful community today. So I think it's pretty safe to say that Dave is Akron's premier historian. Would you agree, John? Well, it's definitely hard to admit that, but he's <laughs> taught me even a few things or two uh, during this taping of this presentation. So Dave, why don't you give us a quick history lesson on how we got to where we are today? Sylvia, our history of philanthropy parallels our history of industrial growth. When Akron was founded by General Simon Perkins in 1825, he attracted settlers who brought with them values that even today continue remarkable traditions that make Akron unique. General Perkins was generous to the community. He and Paul Williams donated the land for the Ohio and Erie Canal through what is now downtown Akron. His son, Colonel Simon Perkins, led the formation of Summit County and encouraged the first mental hospital in Ohio. He helped organize Glendale Cemetery and was its president for 41 years. His son, George Todd Perkins, president of B.F. Goodrich, when a group of women wanted to address the needs of children of working mothers. It was the era of the day nursery movement and George Perkins purchased a house for them. In 1910, the Mary Day Nursery became Akron Children's Hospital. We've always had more than our share of immensely talented people. John R. Buchtel supported the creation of the college that is the University of Akron today, and he spent virtually his entire fortune, about $15 million in today's dollars, to make sure the school succeeded. His colleague, Lewis Miller, founded the Chautauqua Assembly in New York, and his son-in-law, Thomas Edison, called Miller one of the kindest men he ever knew. A blacksmith in Akron's Middlebury neighborhood left his entire estate to start a city hospital, and today's Summa Health is still open to all, regardless of ability to pay. In 1914, People's Hospital, now Cleveland Clinic, Akron General, emerged from a citywide fundraising campaign led by F.A. Cyberling, who also gave us the Metro Parks, Sand Run Reservation, and in the 1950s, the gift of Stan Hewitt Hall. Industrial leaders like Cyberling, Harvey Firestone, the O'Neills of General Tire, and Edwin Shaw of Goodrich were all philanthropists who took an active role in the leadership of Greater Akron. We certainly stand on the shoulders of those who have come before us. In 1969, the community leadership decided that there needed to be a tangible representation of the good works being done here. Thus, the Bert A. Polsky Humanitarian Award was created. The first recipients of the Polsky Award were husband and wife, Sherman and Mary Schumacher. That year, the Schumachers donated 116 acres of virgin land at the edge of the Kaiga Valley to create a new metro park, land that they had purchased over the years to save it from development. Mary was among the founding women of the Ohio Ballet, and Sherman was a volunteer leader and fundraiser for the University of Akron. We've honored six married couples over these five decades, but we've had only one mother and child both receive the award. Our second awardee, Grace O'Neill, in 1970, and her son, Jerry, the chairman of the General Tire and Rubber Company, who received the Polsky Award in 1979. Few today likely remember Grace O'Neill, who was also known for her gardening work around the community, particularly at her home, known today as the O'Neill House Bed and Breakfast. But her son, Jerry, recalled his memories in a 2001 interview. She was part of the community, but I don't, you know, nothing like some of the people that I've known since then that, that get active in various committees and commissions and so on. Uh, I, she wasn't that kind of a, of a woman. 
I had a uh, bad accident with a, with a, in 1935 with a soapbox derby car. Destroyed the, the thing itself. I woke up in the hospital and I was in the hospital for five weeks. And, uh, you know, with broken bones and, and so on. And so she was there every day, every day, sitting with me, keeping me company and so on. And trying to do, you know, all she could to keep me happy. Fifteen, you know, I was 13 years old. I was pretty, I was pretty banged up. But uh, she was terrific. One time, Larry McQueen said to my mother, he said, Grace, he said, you know, you got six children. And uh, which is a lot of children. He said, uh, uh, which one do you love the most? And she thought for a minute, she says, the one that's sick. And I thought that was a terrific answer. It really was. It was a Solomon-type answer. <laughs> Fourteen of the Polsky recipients have been women, with many of those in more recent years. But the explanation for why there weren't more in the early days was provided by our 2000 recipient, Ann Brennan. When I graduated from college, the expectation was that you'd probably get married. And life was really simpler in those days because I knew I was supposed to stay home and have children and keep this beautiful home and cook these wonderful meals and do all that fine, wonderful stuff. And David was to go out and to bring the money in. It sounds so archaic now, but at the time, it was just what you did. Anne Brennan, of course, defied those expectations and gave generously of her time and talent to lead multiple organizations of all the women I have met in this community, no one embodies the truly independent woman more than Ann Brennan, who became a leader in causes to eradicate poverty, promote the arts, and support young women in their chosen roles. Of our 58 recipients, we are fortunate to have compiled a remarkable archive of video interviews with 30 of the men and women who have received the Polsky Award. Dave, you started this uh, some years ago. In 2000, for the 175th anniversary of Akron's founding, the Community Foundation supported production of a new video history of the city that I produced for Western Reserve Public Media. A year later, I realized that we had shortchanged recent history, that is the era following World War II, and the people best suited to tell that history were the recipients of the Polsky Award. I interviewed them for a second television program in 2001. After seeing some of those interviews, Dave, I recognized the value that these oral histories added to our community's collective memory. So in 2019, we asked you to add to the archive by interviewing more recent recipients of the award and made a special President's Fund grant to the Akron Summit County Library Special Collections Division. Today, there is an archive of 30 hour-long interviews of these remarkable people, and it's available to anyone who wants to see them at the Summit Memory website. I was surprised that seven of the Polsky awardees, leaders who started life in Akron in very modest conditions, all went to school on the GI Bill, and they would later run our major corporations, Bob Mercer and Chuck Pilliot of Goodyear, Bill Halbert of East Ohio Gas, Congressman John Cyberling and Howard Flood of First National Bank. William Cannell, judge of the juvenile court, went to war after completing a degree at the University of Akron. And a month later, he shipped overseas, where he waited in England for the invasion. Twenty days after D-Day, he crossed the channel with his fellow GIs. But the horrors of the war always stayed with him. It was about the third night we were in the Normandy and uh, we would park the tanks at night along the hedgerows and uh, most of the troops would sleep underneath the tanks because that was good protection and there would be two usually sleep inside of the tank. And I had just come off guard duty that night and I was sleeping under one of the tanks and a little German the airplane had dropped an incendiary bomb. And I don't know how it ever happened, but it went down the turret of this tank. And there were 10 underneath it, eight under the other one, and two in each one. And, and uh, I was a, just 
fell asleep and boom, I hit the top of the, the bottom of that tank and looked over and these shells were going off and it was, it was quite a devastating experience. Cannell and his men were among the first American troops to celebrate the liberation of Paris. As judge of the Summit County Juvenile Court, he achieved national recognition for innovative programs addressing the needs of young people. You can't look at the list of Polsky recipients without mentioning a group of legendary leaders, John S. Knight, Ben Maidenberg, Edwin J. Thomas, and Lyle Buckingham. One of the best storytellers that I've ever met is Carl Hay, our 1992 awardee, and he knew them all. Jack Knight was a, a powerful man in this community. He uh, could lead um, because he controlled, it was his newspaper, and, and uh, with a stroke of a pen, he could talk to 300,000 people. But the guy that got down in the trenches and made it work was Ben Maidenberg. He was something else. He was about six foot four or five. Had the uh, language of a sailor. <laughs> uh, ladies groups always hesitated to have him speak because he'd shock them. But never was any doubt about Ben's uh, love for this city or the city's respect for him. Eddie Thomas, probably I would say the most revered of any community leader we've ever had. Uh, Jack Knight was the most powerful, respected, uh, uh, I mean, and, and sometimes almost in fear or held in awe. I have heard people say, and I think it's at Goodyear, they said they'd take a bullet for Eddie Thomas. He was loved. And when Eddie spoke, people listened out of pure respect and love. Carl Hay himself led a distinguished career as a lawyer and the leader of so many charitable and civic organizations, almost singly responsible for creating the Convention and Visitors Bureau that today is at the center of a billion dollar a year hospitality industry in Summit County. Another one of these legendary local leaders was a driving force for Akron's black community and civil rights causes. Our 1982 recipient, and first African-American recipient, Vernon L. Odom, is remembered by our 1998 honoree, Dorothy Jackson. I think Vernon Odom was just a giant in this community. He was, he was a gentle giant. And he was regarded by not only the black community, but the white community, that he really spoke with a voice and he really had passion and he really tried to do things. A lot of the young black leaders today counted Vernon as their dad. As a community, we've never been more conscious of our responsibilities to equity and justice as we are today. But the nation, including Akron, was not always that way. People of color suffered overt discrimination for much of the 20th century. Akron was a segregated city in many respects, in hiring, in education, in social acceptance. Dorothy Jackson recalls one painful experience from the 1940s. You knew that if your mother took you downtown, you did not try to go and sit at the counter in Scott's 5 and 10. They had a little hot dog counter there and sandwiches. You knew that you were not allowed to, you know, your, my mother just told us. And she didn't say because it was race or what. She just said, we're not supposed to sit in those seats. What a difference that makes when, when parents don't give you adult burdens. Carla Moore, our 2017 recipient, grew up in West Akron. In 1968, on a Saturday afternoon, she and a high school friend dressed up to have a fun trip to the elegant Georgian room at the M. O'Neill department store. We were seated and we sat and talked and we talked and talked and then we noticed that people around us were being served and nobody came to take our order. 20 minutes, 30 minutes went by and it was like it just dawned on us. We had never thought about it. It dawned on us that they had no intentions of serving us. Judge Moore and Dorothy Jackson had successful careers in public service. 
Carla became a civil rights attorney for the Ohio Attorney General, a lawyer with the Buckingham, Doolittle, and Burroughs Law Firm in Akron, and eventually was seated in a place she had not expected as a judge. The first day that I put that robe on and sat on the bench, I knew that that's where I belonged. It was a ministry. Judge Moore retired as a judge on the Ninth District Court of Appeals. When we honored the Reverend Dr. Ronald J. Fowler in 2006, we had the chance to reflect on the renewal of Akron, especially in those pockets of poverty that were so long neglected. For Pastor Fowler, he would establish a church in one of the city's neediest neighborhoods along East Arlington Street. I went to see, see the mayor and I told him I had a dream. And, and the dream was very simple. It was about transforming a community and starting with the removal of, you know, the blight that was there and we could be a part of that and, um, and establishing a community of faith which would maybe hopefully send a signal to the community that we believe in this place. And he so liked what I was saying that I, I'll never forget he, he picked up the phone and called the fire chief and the mayor just simply said to the chief, you know, what can we do? And he said, well, we can, we can enforce code. So we were having a little small impact, you know, on the, on the area. And, uh, and so one of my members came to me and said, her father told me to tell me, be careful that, um, that the drug dealers are not happy. And it, it didn't greatly concern, it concerned my wife. Pastor Fowler later served on the Akron School Board, was its president, and played a key role in community conversations about race in the Coming Together initiative that brought President Bill Clinton to Akron for the nation's very first town meeting on race in 1997. While our community still has a long way to go when it comes to racial equity and social justice, we're motivated by the leaders who have paved the way for change. Akron has been blessed for a city of our size to have so many leaders of renown. The Community Foundation took over the award from the Chamber and presented its first Polsky Award in 1990 to Goodyear Executive and Knight Foundation President C.C. Gibson. One of the Foundation's organizers, Bish McIntosh, was honored in 1971. Our former Executive Director, John Feudner, in 1980 and school superintendent, Dr. Clinton Barrett, in 1988. We've paid tribute with the Polsky Award to business leaders who were civic-minded and generous with their gifts of time, talent, and treasure. Bud and Susie Rogers were honored in 2008. Ohio Edison Chairman Justin Rogers was the recipient in 2004, and in 2003, Charlie Booth was honored. And for those who knew him, You'll remember Charlie's eyes lighting up and that laugh and chuckle of his when he was preparing to share some little jewel of wisdom or scoop on some news that he heard before anyone else did. And in 1993, the award was given posthumously to a real humanitarian, Bill Perry. The 1983 recipient was the A. Shulman Company's chairman, William Zekin. The patron of the new Akron Public Library, Frank W. Steer, was the 1981 awardee. And in 1977, Bruce Mansfield, president of Ohio Edison, was singled out for being a generous benefactor of causes centered around addiction. Our 2002 recipient, Roger Reed, led Harwick Chemical Company, but was known for his service to programs like Leadership Akron. Roger has lifted up our community not only with his philanthropy, but has devoted his time and his management talents to dozens of Akron's charitable organizations. Our 2018 recipient, Tom Knoll, served the needs of many companies as their attorney and has been dedicated to polishing Akron's image through the Firestone PGA tournaments and founding First Tee for inner city youngsters to learn the game of golf. And there are other recipients over the last 50 years whom we still fondly remember.
And while most of our recipients have been successful in business and accumulated accomplishments, many did not start out life that way. Our 2015 recipient, Joe Canfer, the retired chairman of Gojo, they're the creator of Purewell, by the way, a little product that you perhaps heard of, uh, particularly this past year, uh, typifies the stories of these men and women who started out in such modest circumstances. During the Depression, uh, the, people that were, the people that were hungry would mark the curbs of the houses where you could get food. And I was always told that my grandmother, who also died when I was young, um, her curb was always marked, that she always had food for someone who, who was in need. And that was not a, she, they were not wealthy people. They lived in a very modest, modest home. I, I actually drove by there just last week. I do that about once every other year or so, just to bring back the memories. And I always look at the curb and remember the story of the fact, you know, thinking that maybe that was formative in my life of thinking that you have to take care of you know, you have to take care of others. It's, you don't live just for yourself. That sentiment, not living for just yourself, can also be the mantra of our 2014 recipient, Renick Andrioli, the owner of the Akron Fairlawn Hilton. When we invited him to be on the board of Akron Community Foundation, he says he hadn't given a lot of thought to the wider community. But as a member of our grant distribution committee, he became enlightened about the community's great needs. Rennick co-founded the Communal Family Foundation that assists families struggling with a cancer diagnosis. He has supported Children's Hospital and has led the fundraising efforts for Summa's Foundation, raising $75 million in the last two years alone. But his heart and soul were touched by the Akron Rotary Camp for Children with Special Needs, where he and his wife Dee led the effort to build seven cabins and raised almost five million dollars for their efforts. So we built the first cabin and uh, then we started raising money. We started doing more cabins. I got uh, home builders involved and other uh, volunteers to, to build the cabin. So we got all the cabins done and then we did the resource center and we've just had a phenomenal amount of success. It's a great facility. I, I just love it. I, it. My wife and I, just it's one of our favorite charities. I was out there the other day and went all, with all the, the kids out there and the counselors, and, I, and it pulls on my heartstrings when I see those counselors and how they work and interact with those kids. This community has been very, very good to us, and so I have a very willing partner who is really on the same page with me it impacted all of us deeply in the Akron Community Foundation family last month when we learned of Dee Andrioli's passing. She joins other members of our Polsky family whom we have lost since we last convened at the Hilton in 2019. Retired Goodyear Chairman Bob Mercer died in August of 2020. He was a champion for ethical behavior in business and was dedicated as much to his 132,000 employees as he was his 47,000 shareholders. Bob's intellect and wit served him well when he faced the dual evils of greed and gluttony, as he put it in facing off in 1986 against Great Britain's great green mailer, Sir James Goldsmith, whose plans were to all but destroy the Akron company that had grown to be one of the great tire companies on the globe. Well, I insisted in front of uh, Goldman Sachs that I get a hold of Goldsmith and go over and visit him, and they advised against it. And I said, hey, he's my biggest shareholder. So I went over to his apartment in the upper Manhattan, and as I walked in there, these huge uh, statues of naked women standing there, you know. And I looked around, and he said, uh, Sir James will meet you on the second floor. So we went into this. Uh, dining room. I mean, it was huge. It looked like something out of Hollywood. Uh, and he sat in front of the fireplace. Over the fireplace was this huge picture of an absolutely gorgeous, totally naked woman. And I said to myself, I'm not going to let him catch me looking at that. Although I wanted to say, your mother was certainly a nice looking woman. 
He said, your company has been very poorly managed. And he made the point uh, repeatedly that we were over diversified and he was going to put an end to that. Hey, here's a guy who's got a wife and two mistresses and he's accusing us of over diversification. You know? We miss Bob Mercer's leadership and his sense of humor. In February of this year, we lost one of the great friends of this community, Phil Maynard. Phil admits that he too was consumed with growing his business for the first 25 years he was in the community. But then he became a member of the Children's Hospital Board and gave so generously to Interval Brotherhood Home. That was just the beginning of two decades of leadership gifts that he made to dozens of community organizations. But he not only led with his checkbook, he led with his heart and his mind and talent. This is home, uh, my roots. And I think there's a lot to be said for that. You know, they, they, and they talk about the Midwest people and, and you see it. The uh, willingness in, in most cases to, uh, to work together, to work for a common good. I just feel uh, at home here uh, and not intimidated, not threatened, uh, safe, if you will. You know, I'm a, I'm a blessed man. I, I talk about my journey. I learned that, uh, that none of us get out of here alive. But I think at the end of the road, the things that you've, you've done for others and the things that, that made you feel good are, are the most important things. It really, it gives you peace of mind. Do as well as you can, and I really think I have tried. Among greater Akron's community assets is the Akron Symphony Orchestra, and we thank its Gospel Meets Symphony Ensemble for providing that wonderful tribute to our program. Your Akron Community Foundation supports the orchestra and chorus, as well as nearly every other arts organization in town, music,
theater, the visual arts, and dance exist in part because of the generous contributions of donors to the foundation. The history of our anchor institutions, the symphony, Tuesday Musical Club, the Akron Art Museum, all had their roots in a movement created by women beginning in the 1920s. Ohio Ballet in Akron owed its life to leadership of women, including 1987 recipient Francia Albrecht. Her life spanned that time when Akron had few arts offerings to the current century when arts organizations have flourished. When these wonderful organizations such as the Art Museum was founded, uh, it had been just a little hideaway up on Fur Hill somewhere with nothing much, but they knew that they had to volunteer. Weathervane, Weathervane is nobly done by the women's board there. Women were so deeply involved right away with Stan Hewitt. It was the women who made it, and they still make it. Women leaders who have received the Polsky Award include Belle Miller, who inspired the good work of Akron Child Guidance Center, Eileen Berg, who received the award in 2013 with her late husband, Pete. Betty Dalton was the recipient in 2005 after a lifetime of service to the public schools. Catherine Motes Hunter, was the Polsky recipient in 2010, a woman who started one of the first leadership initiatives for women in the community. And there has never been a fundraiser like the 2009 Polsky recipient, Madeline Bozzelli. When Cliff Izeroff was selected in 2001, he was honored with his wife, Judith, who loved Akron all of their lives. Personally, I miss Cliff's phone calls that would come a few weeks before the Polsky Committee would convene to deliberate and make their annual selection of an honoree. Cliff would ask, what do you hear? What's the word on the street? Are there any front runners or new nominees? There's a gallery named for them both at the Akron Art Museum, just one of many recognitions. But Judy's baby was Keep Akron Beautiful, the program she founded that has been recognized nationally which is currently in its 40th year. Really, the program never would have gotten off the ground without the Akron Community Foundation and John Fugner. Tom Sawyer said to me that people don't notice the absence of litter so much as the addition of flowers. They absolutely loved it. It was embarrassing. One time at a women's network luncheon, it was about my first one, everybody was asked to stand up and introduce themselves, and when I say what they did, and when I did, they start applauding. I was embarrassed, really. I said to myself laughingly one day, what's a nice Jewish girl doing picking up litter on Howard Street <laughs> on a Saturday afternoon? I made friends in, in every neighborhood. The story of the Polsky Award recipients is really the story of the events and people who have built the most important elements of our community. John Cyberling began his love for the Cuyahoga Valley when his father would take him on bike rides and walks through the area in the 1930s. He was elected to Congress in 1970 after a career in the legal department at Goodyear. He was already an environmental activist, trying to do what he could to protect overdevelopment of the beautiful Cuyahoga Valley. In his second year in Congress, he was seated on the House Committee on Interior Affairs which was responsible for national parks. In 1974, I got the subcommittee to come out and look at the Cuyahoga Valley. And we took them on a complete tour, including both an aerial tour and a hiking tour. And they were, I knew they'd be impressed. And um, I was told that the chairman of the subcommittee, uh, Roy Taylor of North Carolina, uh, on the way up in the plane told the, his staff person, now of course this Cuyahoga Valley isn't going to be of national park caliber, but John's a good member of the subcommittee and we want to help him. And the same staffer told me that all the way back on the plane, Roy Taylor was saying, now that's a wonderful place and we have to save it. Subsequent studies by the Greater Akron Chamber have shown time and time again that being a gateway to the Cuyahoga Valley National Park has frequently been part of companies' decisions to relocate to our community. And the health of the greater Acre community 
would never be as good as it is without our Polsky recipients. People like Bill Considine, who served as an advocate for our children during his four decade long tenure at the helm of Akron Children's Hospital. Or Jim and Vanita Olschlager. Jim was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis 40 years ago. Jim has directed his energy, his intellect, and more than $20 million to the Oak Clinic, a nonprofit outpatient facility specializing in multiple sclerosis for everyone with MS, regardless of their ability to pay. The Olschlager's gifts have also benefited Akron Children's Hospital, and their support of SUMA Health System now exceeds $7 million. In recent years, Jim and Vanita's total charitable contributions have exceeded over $100 million. Dr. Terry Gordon, our 2012 recipient, was an accomplished physician and cardiologist, and the first in Akron to implant a defibrillator in a heart patient during the golden age of cardiology. But the hundreds of lives that he would eventually save arose out of a campaign he launched statewide to make sure that external AEDs were available in schools, public buildings, and even police cars throughout Ohio. He was named National Physician of the Year in 2002. Terry suffered a personal tragedy when his son was left a quadriplegic after a skiing accident. His introspective writings have assisted thousands of people going through grief and loss. And God said, yes, you can do this. And I said, but, but how? I just don't know how to do this. And the most profound thing was said by God when he said, treat this as if it was something you had chosen. And it took a while, but I came to this place where I truly believe that everything's in perfect order, even what we perceive of as bad. But there's no such thing as a bad experience because if we learn even one small thing from an experience, it's no longer a negative experience. It's a positive experience. It's impossible to fit the inspiring lives of all 58 Polsky recipients into this presentation. If you know me, you know I'd be happy to keep on talking about them, but we've been proud to capture a sampling of their life stories. So instead, I'll leave you with the tradition I started 12 years ago, a poem to honor all of our historical Polsky recipients. Imagine capturing the history of an award that has celebrated our community's best. Let's reflect for a moment on the giants we've honored who stand out and above all the rest. For decades we've gathered and marveled at how wonderfully they've all given back. Their leadership, character, and generosity chronicled, their impact impossible to track. Life's choices and journeys brought them here to this place They've made such a difference, it's true. Unselfishly leaving lasting marks on our town, never imagining would be remembering them too. They made it look easy without giving it much thought, giving back, or at least that's how we all feel. With admiration and gratitude, we honor them tonight, and to our community, it's meant such a great deal. Looking back to 1969, there have been 58 Polsky Awards with names that obviously ring a bell. Odom, Buckingham, Cyberling, and Knight, whose life stories we've been eager to tell. More recently, we've honored and lost some of our finest, fond memories that bring them to mind. Hunter, Dalton, Berg, Booth, and Maynard in the Polsky tradition all humble and kind. Servant leader best describes how thoughtfully they lived, humanely giving back, helping others, never really knowing or meeting those they touched, young children, homeless vets, struggling mothers. A Polsky retrospective after a year like no other should help to uplift and inspire. How will we embody these lives so well lived and be filled with such hope and desire. Desire to contribute of our time and our treasure, their examples we model and borrow. Let's promise today to follow their lead and bring hope and promise 
to tomorrow. message from our times is that character does count. Deeds, deeds of kindness do count. And being truthful does count. I have always believed I was, I was born um, to serve. Our people in this community are absolutely outstanding, tremendously dedicated. Uh, I enjoy working with them, and that's a lot of what drives me. We're here for a short period of time. Certainly I want people to think of me as uh, a good employer, a good husband, but I think what's really going to define us in our legacy is our uh, philanthropy. It really is more blessed to give than to receive. I've received so much from this community where I was born and educated and, you know, nurtured. Um, and I just want to give back. Yeah.